Hello Tolkien geeks, and Happy Hobbit Day 2021 to you! If you're new to the channel, I'd very much like to encourage you to subscribe and hit the bell icon button to activate notifications for all of my future uploads, which massively helps the channel. This video is part of the Tolkien YouTube community's annual playlist for the birthdays of Bilbo and Frodo, so check out the link for that at the end of the video. I will also have an announcement to make at the end of this video about the future of the channel. Stay tuned! As we all surely know, at the end of The Lord of the Rings, two and a half years after the downfall of Barad-dûr, the ring-bearer Frodo Baggins passes over the sea, sailing to the Undying Lands with his uncle Bilbo, together with the bearers of the three elven rings, the Lady Galadriel, Elrond Half-Elven, and the wizard Gandalf. What some of you may not be aware of is that this wasn't the final recorded journey to Aman which the Lord of the Rings describes for us. Appendix B, The Tale of Years, tells us that Rose Gamgee, wife of Samwise of course, died on Mid-Year's Day in the year 1482 of the Shire Reckoning calendar which is 61 years after the departure of Frodo. And the same entry also tells us that later that year, leaving on Frodo and Bilbo's birthday as it happens, which was today, September the 22nd, Samwise travels to the Grey Havens to follow his master over the sea. It was said that Sam was last seen by his daughter Eleanor at her family's dwelling in the Tower Hills on the western borders of the Shire, and there he gives her the Red Book of Westmarch, the writings of Bilbo and Frodo, from which the story of the Lord of the Rings was said to have been passed down, and eventually translated into English by Tolkien himself. Perhaps because of the narrative frame of The Lord of the Rings, this conceit that this was an historical document which was passed down through many hands until it reached the modern era, we don't know for sure what happened to Samwise after the point at which he relinquishes the Red Book, because it wasn't recorded by the characters, except to say that Eleanor handed down the tradition that her father passed over the sea. By the time of Samwise's final journey, Frodo, who was the much older hobbit, would have been 114 years old. This kind of age is not by any means out of the question for a regular hobbit, even without a ring of power stretching out his natural life but dwelling in Amman by itself categorically does not confer immortal life upon a mortal, and even to assume that a mortal person would be capable of living a long and blissful life after being allowed to settle in Amman is not necessarily supported by the evidence. So is it really likely that the two friends did one day meet again on that distant shore? The Numenorians had eventually come to erroneously believe that the land of Amman would grant them eternal life during the reign of Tar Atanamir, the thirteenth king of the island, and they envied the Eldar for it. The Akalabeth section of the Silmarillion tells us that, in response to their openly speaking against the so-called Ban of the Valar, the dictate that the men of that island must not sail west out of sight of their own lands, Manwe himself, king of the Valar, sends messages to the king, and they proclaim the following message. The doom of the world, they said, one alone can change who made it, 
And were you so to voyage that escaping all deceits and snares, you came indeed to Amman, the blessed realm, little would it profit you. For it is not the land of Manway that makes its people deathless, but the deathless that dwell therein have hallowed the land, and there you would but wither and grow weary the sooner, as moths in a light too strong and steadfast. The one who can change the doom of the world is God, of course, whom the elves call Eru Iluvatar. The point of this message seems clear enough, and we have no reason to doubt the accuracy of these statements. Although it is also true that the rules have been bent slightly in the past for other mortals. Perhaps the most relevant example of this is Tuor, the father of Eärendil, who was known for being sent by the Valar to the hidden elven city of Gondolin to save its people. The Silmarillion tells us that in after days, it was sung that Tuor alone of mortal men was numbered among the elder race, and was joined with the Noldor, whom he loved, and his fate is sundered from the fate of men. This is vague enough that we don't know precisely what happened to Tuor whether he lived out the rest of his natural life in Amman, or whether Eru himself intervened in his specific case is not stated with certainty in the Silmarillion. We never learn that Eärendil the Mariner was ever reunited with his father. Tolkien did write, however, in an unsent letter addressed to the owner of a Catholic bookshop in Oxford, who had raised various theological concerns with him, that Tuor receives the elvish limited immortality, though Tolkien does note here both that this was a unique exception, and that this was only the outcome that was supposed by the elves, and not stated to be fact. When we consider that Tuor's fate was noted by the author to be a unique exception, it suggests to me that Frodo's fate was not similar to Tuor's in this way, and if Frodo indeed remained mortal, as we should assume, with the lack of any evidence to the contrary, then it seems likely also that the suggestion made by the messengers of Manway to the Numenorians applies equally to Frodo, that he will have also withered and grown weary faster in the decades prior to Sam following him there. One final data point that we should also mention on Frodo's fate is Tolkien's gloss of the ending to The Lord of the Rings in another, even more well-known letter, which he wrote to the publisher Milton Waldman, and which is partially reproduced as an introduction to The Silmarillion. He says, To Bilbo and Frodo, the special grace is granted to go with the elves they loved an Arthurian ending, in which it is, of course, not made explicit whether this is an allegory of death, or a mode of healing and restoration leading to a return. The reference to Frodo's Arthurian ending refers to the similarity to the legend of Avalon, the island which King Arthur was said to have sailed after receiving a mortal wound in his final battle. The circumstances of that battle, and Arthur's voyage to Avalon, differ depending on which version of the legend is being told. Frodo also is the recipient of a wound at the hands of the Witch King, which, although healed by the skill of Elrond, has left seemingly permanent spiritual damage to him. It may be that Frodo, just like Arthur, had sailed to the lonely isle Tol Eresea in order to be released from his suffering. As I say, versions of the story of the death of Arthur vary considerably, and Tolkien is recreating that ambiguity. 
The last word on this has to be that this is all guesswork and supposition. We can't know for sure what happened to the ring bearers, or to the other members of the Fellowship, once they took the straight road to Amman. Legolas took a very, very elderly Gimli with him when he finally sailed west, almost 60 years after Samwise did, and we don't know any more about their fates either than we do of Frodo and Sam. Tolkien invites us to invest our imagination when considering the Hobbit's final fates. Fan fiction has been written about this many times before, including by myself, I can tell you, years ago as a very young Tolkien fan. And it certainly isn't for me to instruct anyone else what to believe about this unanswered question. It is quite a comforting thought to think about Sam and Frodo reuniting one final time amongst the elves whom they both loved dearly. But it might also be comforting to think that Frodo reached an end to his suffering, in the bliss and tranquility of the Undying Lands. What do you think about Sam and Frodo's final fates? Did they meet and embrace one final time before Frodo passed out of this world? Let me know in the comments below. Voice of Geekdom has been around for well over a year now, and the channel continues to grow bit by bit. I wasn't any kind of video editor before I started this channel, and everything that I have done here has been a massive learning curve. I decided recently to start a Patreon to help support the continued development of the channel, as I continue my journey towards building something special here. I hope that many of you who are regular, loyal viewers can appreciate that I have always strived to bring something a little different and unique to the discussion, compared with some of the other Tolkien lore channels out there who do such a great job of what they do. You'll find more details of what to expect with Patreon membership on the page itself. The link can be found in the description below. But the most important benefit that this should bring to you, the viewer, is that I'm hoping to gradually increase the rate at which I'm able to bring you new videos. And I hope that you are as excited by that as I am.